I live and teach in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm happy to introduce my good friend, Juan Kramer. We've known each other many years. We started out on this journey kind of together learning. And uh, Warren has uh, traveled the world teaching. And um, he lives in Boston with his wife and team and son Adam. And uh, this, this particular topic is especially close to my wealth owl because I, uh, <laughs> I healed from Crohn's disease due to an acrobatic uh, concept and program. And it was a healing journey that gave me my life. And so without further ado, Warren will answer all the about questions today. I hope you love Can this be adjusted, Doctor? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Can the volume be adjusted yeah. on the mic? Maybe. Yeah. Testing one, two. Thank you very much. All of life is one process of taking in and giving out. All of life is that. You know, I often joke about it and say life is one big discharge. Yeah? It is. Take in, give out, in all, in all ways. And digestive problems have become really epidemic. I'm going to use that word, but epidemic problems. I'm not going to assume everybody in this room has trouble, but going by statistics, 70%, 70% of us do. Okay? It's up there. And um, they've, they've just gotten worse over the years. I live in Boston, Massachusetts, and I know one of the hospitals in the area opened up a number of years ago a, a just a digestive health clinic specifically for chronic digestive disorders, Crohn's, colitis, irritable bowel, etc. And I, I can honestly say to you that within you know the work that I do in macrobiotics, uh, which I described in that last lecture, I could say a couple words again about it if some of you are not familiar, but in, in the macrobiotic approach, it's actually quite effective. And I've seen people reverse many serious digestive issues, not just constipation or like that, but serious problems over the years. And uh, I wanna, wanna share that with you tonight. So basically, if we could take in and utilize what we need and get rid of what we don't need, generally speaking, our health can stay pretty good. Our, our health overall can stay pretty, pretty good. We can have pretty good health. Once we lose that ability to get rid of what we don't need, right? once we can't get rid of it, that's when trouble begins. So I'm really a firm believer that most health problems begin in the, in the gut, in the digestive system. What's made it challenging is over the years is that we're taking in many things now that really were never, never meant to be consumed. That's part of the problem. You know, this, these digestive systems that we have never saw red dye six, green seven, blue eight, carnauba wax, which is what I put on my car when I get a car wash, but somehow it's okay to put on a jelly bean and coat it so it's nice and crunchy when it goes down. So a lot of these things that we're taking in, they're just very difficult to get rid of. Part of the problem It's just that. We're eating things that are just foreign to the body. Uh, chemicalized foods, uh, genetically modified foods, on and on is the problem. And on top of that, and I'm also talk about simply taking in more than what we need makes trouble as well. Even if it's good food, it doesn't matter. It still will make trouble. Excess is excess. And you know that the theme I'm gonna talk about quite a bit tonight. And so I'm sorry for those of you that like to eat, like me, although you may look at me and think this guy doesn't like to eat. Yes, I like to eat. I do. And believe me, I, so any of you sitting at a table with me the last day or two saw I took a couple seconds on, on certain items that I really liked, like the soup. Anyway. So, strong digestion and stable blood sugar are really what we need for good health. So strong digestion and stable blood sugar. Strong digestion also means utilizing what we take in. It's not just eliminating, eliminating, it's actually absorption. 
are we able to absorb what we take in? And that's a problem also for some people. We know that our normal means of elimination as a human being are bowels and urination, for a woman menstruation, our breathing. And, and by the way, in traditional Chinese medicine, the lungs and the colon are paired organs. The lungs and the colon. They're known as the metal element organs. And they're most active in the fall, right? The fall months. That's why you see in the fall, more issues surrounding the lungs come to a head. As you're gonna see now in the springtime, which is February, March, more liver, gallbladder issues are gonna to come to a head. They're gonna to come to the surface more, right? And in the summer, more issues with the heart and small intestine. Later in the summer, more issues with the spleen, pancreas, and stomach, like that. And in the wintertime, the kidneys and bladder. So there's a kind of cyclical, there's a cycle that goes on with these organs. And so when the fall comes around, it's especially a good time to focus on lung and colon health. And if you help one, you help the other. If there's an issue with the colon, it does affect the lungs, both physically and emotionally. One of the strongest emotions related to the lungs is actually depression, despair, grief. And in fact, what I've noticed over the years, especially with lung cancer and lung problems, usually what precedes, what comes before this lung trouble actually is some loss, some kind of shock, some kind of grief that was there that actually affects the lungs. Not just because someone had some too much Ben and Jerry's Chunky Monkey, but it also emotionally something affected the lungs. And so that emotion come, you know, brings that on, so to speak. Okay. I mentioned earlier in the lecture prior, my first lecture, that house clutter also stagnates those bowels. So I want to say from the start, one of the things that you can do to help your digestion when you get home is really do a good cleaning out. Yeah, literally. Get things moving. You know, when I, many years ago, when I used to do traveling cooking, I, I did for about six, six and a half years, live with mainly, mainly cancer patients, go to people's homes, and teach macrobiotic cooking, and doing shiatsu massage, and teaching natural remedies. Early on, I got to see the kind of environment that a lot of people were living in. And one of the things that I saw was the clutter. And after a few cooking jobs, I decided what I was going to do when I got there, first thing, was do a cleaning out, especially of the bedroom and the kitchen. Two most important places to start with, bedroom and kitchen. Right? And it makes an enormous difference when you're trying to release and let go, which is literally what the colon, colon is. Okay? Holding on is an imbalance. So stuff that we're holding on to, like we think we're going to need, you know, National Geographic from 1926 that we know are going to be worth a million dollars, you might want to move them on. Okay? So the two times a year at our home that we do a cleaning are spring and actually fall, right after the summer. We do that twice a year. Okay? First of all, what is healthy bowel movement? So I'm sorry, I know this is right after dinner. It gets a little, 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 little funky here, but what can you do? So healthy bowel movement, what is that? Okay. So the shape, as I described earlier, and the color, is called a golden banana. A golden banana. It should actually have a pleasant shape. It should actually smile at you when it's in the toilet. Hi there. It should smile at you. It should not be broken up. Right? It actually should float a little bit before it sinks, right? So it has buoyancy, which means actually that the balance of minerals, protein, fat, that you're eating was good that day. If it sinks like an anchor in the MSC ship, <laughs> basic, yeah, plunk to the bottom like some rabbit pellet, it usually means that what you were eating literally that day was, was too heavy and dense and heavy on the liver and gallbladder that could come from too many, too much dry foods, too many chips, not enough light dishes. So it shows our balance with our food, our, our, our nutrition day to day, okay? We should not need tremendous amounts of toilet paper to clean up. I don't know if you've noticed, rolls have become enormous. 
like everything, like supersized new toilet bowls. <laughs> we should not need a lot. If we need a lot, <laughs> sorry again, after dinner, but <laughs> someone's gonna talk about it. I don't know what you know, Dr. Blywise talked about, but yeah, he talked about this already. If we need a lot, it usually shows that we're having too much fruits, desserts, sweets, too much what I call yin, Y-I-N, that makes this more wet, so to speak, almost closer to diarrhea-like. Right? So we shouldn't need a lot. Normal is once, twice a day. In the morning when you get up, without eating or drinking, you go. Effortlessly, you go. I know some of you thinking that's never going to happen. <laughs> Truthfully, honestly, that never happened to me up till when I started microbiotics. Never. I heard that like, yeah, right, that's going to happen. Never. Yep. There you go. Just should be normal, we go. Okay? We should not have to sit on the toilet and read War and Peace <laughs> together. Now, I need to say this though. There was a home I went to many years ago, and I told this to a guy living there, because I, I said in his, in his bathroom, it was like a library. And I said, what, what's up with the books, the magazines? And you've got, like, it's like a library in this bathroom. Because Warren, you're not married. And I wasn't at the time, because you don't understand. This is my cave. My wife, she won't go in here. For a couple of reasons. I said, I got it, okay. All kidding aside. With healthy development, we sit down, we go. It's not an effort to go. I mean, I could, I don't mind, I'm an open book. When I was growing up in New York, seriously, I'd be sitting on the toilet crying. Yeah, I didn't touch a vegetable till I was 21. Unless you include ketchup, Heinz as a vegetable. So I would sit there really crying for a long time and out would come maybe one little pellet. Mm -hmm. So I know bad bowel movement, or non-existent. Yeah. So we shouldn't need to spend so long on the toilet to go. Okay? And, as I think some of you know, most of you I hope know, when you eat, switch from basically animal protein to plant food, you know what's coming out of you is bigger, right? Definitely bigger, so that's good. And now when I switch to plant-based food, I'm like, oh my goodness, what's coming out there? I feel like half of me's left in the toilet. And, and the other thing, and, and I know it's, it's, some of you are aware of this, getting used to the feeling of being light, being lighter in your body, is a little, can be a little uncomfortable in the beginning. Because when, when you're eating a lot of animal protein and heavy foods, you, you feel heavier in your body. Naturally, as you start eating more plant-based food, you feel lighter in your being, which is not a bad thing. It's just you have to get used to that. And I, I know over the years I've talked to quite a few men about this because that's when men said, mm, I'm not satisfied, I need something to like, you know, give me some, some, give me the meat, so to speak, you know, give me something substantial. But you have to get used to feeling lighter in the body. And in general, as human beings, and I mentioned this in my last lecture, we should get more comfortable feeling a little bit more empty. Human beings always feel better when we feel a little empty inside. Not full, not stuffed, but light. Almost like we can float. Like how children are. And that can come back. But we need to work towards keeping our overall condition a little bit more empty inside. Okay? That's very important. Okay. Then. It's very important, actually, to be able to move our bowels, as I said, first thing in the morning. In, in traditional Chinese medicine, the lungs and large intestine, there's a 24-hour cycle clock. So the clock that relates to the cold and being active is actually 5 to 7 in the morning. So the normal time to move our bowels is actually first thing. That's why when people sleep in late, 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock, it actually stagnates your digestion. It's not good for digestive health. I, I tell people, really, try to get up at least by 7 a.m., somewhere between 6 and 7. And then you'll notice that's going to activate the, that digestion more. Sleeping in later, not good. It's kind of like the, the analogy is, you know, if you ever fell asleep on the beach you know, with the sun up and you wake up and you feel like drunk from the sun, because we can't take in the, the rays, the sun's rays, 
way more horizontal. And so when we get up early, the energy of that day activates our digestive system. What's a vicious circle is people that have really sluggish intestines sometimes struggle to get up early in the morning. Right? So that helps a great deal as well. Okay. The last point about this is that also we should not need food to move our bowels. Almost like a, a, a centipede or something. You eat, it comes out. It's not like that. It should naturally move because peristalsis is strong. Right? And, and again, that can come back. Okay. I want to talk about now di diagnosis of colon health. How do we diagnose that? So let's look at that. The condition of our intestines. Okay. I can move this a little bit so some of you can get a good look after, so I'll move it over. So, this is a, a face. I talked about this in the diagnosis lecture. I wish I had one for each side, but... Okay. So, the mouth is the entrance to the digestive system. The mouth. Okay? The mouth. This is the beginning of the digestive system. Of course, that's the end. So, the top lip shows the stomach. The top lip is your stomach. The bottom lip is the colon. Okay? What's interesting over the years is that mouths in general have gotten larger, more expanded, gotten bigger. If you look at some of these old, like Greek statues, the mouths were very like, small and more pursed. They weren't large, they were smaller. When they're smaller, that shows that digestion, this whole digestive tract is stronger, is more gathered. Not in a bad way, like overly contracted, because that can happen too. But if there's good contraction there. When it gets bigger, the mouths get bigger, that's showing that this is expanding. Did any of you have a, sl have a slinky when you grew up? Did you ever take that slinky and stretch it out and it's not a slinky anymore? I did it all the time. Mom, my slinky, I stretched out. Yeah, why'd you do that? Oh, I need a new one. The intestines expand and contract. They expand and contract. Peristalsis. That's a must for good, strong digestion, to be able to do that, okay? When this starts to get swollen, it's showing that this is more expanded. And where you see that especially is the bottom lip. The bottom lip relates to the colon, the large intestine, the bowel, okay? What you're looking for basically, number one, is the relationship between top and bottom should be the same. So in other words, vertical. The vertical distance between upper and lower should be the same. What you commonly see is the top lip may be more contracted than the bottom lip may be more swollen, more extended, okay? or vice versa. Or maybe there's no bottom lip. Right? Remember that president that used to say, read my lips? He had no lips. He couldn't read anything anyway. He had digestive problems, but we won't go there. So the top and the bottom should be more even. Okay, should be even. When the bottom lip gets swollen, that's showing that the colon itself is loose and expanded. And also because the relationship between this and the and brain are connected, that actually shows what's going on with our thinking ability. Mm -hmm. And it's been shown more and more that what's going on with Alzheimer's disease, memory issues, basically relate to the gut, the microbiome of the intestines. This we've been talking about for eons in macrobiotic education. The relationship between the brain and the intestines. ADD, ADHD, autism, etc. gut health. So the bottom lip when it's swollen is showing expansion. The bottom lip also can be broken down into thirds. Thirds, okay? So ascending colon, transverse, descending colon, right? Up the right, across, and down. This third on the right side is ascending colon. The middle is transverse. And this is descending. So what you look for on the bottom lip, is it even? Is, is there one side that's more swollen? Is the center part coming out? Is this side? Is there some kind of uh, irritation in part of the lip? Is there a cold sore? What's going on in the bottom lip? That tells you which part of the digestive, the colon, is an issue. 
Then there's the coloration. So sometimes what you see across the bottom lip is maybe a white line going across. That corresponds, the bottom lip corresponds with the nail beds. So when the nails start to lose their nice pink color and get more white, that shows anemia or some anemic condition. That circulation through the intestines is not active. And it's the same thing with the bottom lip, this gets white. You see this sometimes when people are going through chemotherapy. Right? Often it's good for us. And you see this sometimes at some like senior residents, homes, and some elders. You see this at the home getting very white, even the all face getting too white. Because there's a lack of circulation. Even the, the tip of the nose may look like powder on it, like there's baby powder, because there's no circulation. Right? So if there's circulation, naturally, there's a good pink color, there's vibrancy that you see. Right? The top lip, which is the stomach, often is the site of like blisters. Again, cold sores often appear here in the top lip. Because the stomach especially is influenced by acidity, over acidity. Right? So you see that there. When the bottom of the lip, the bottom lip itself, uh, gets uh, like a reddish purple color, that shows inflammation. So sometimes what you see with colitis and irritable bowel, the bottom lip will be like purple. It'd be maybe like a bright red color. That's showing inflammation. Okay? Chap lips. Outside of the weather maybe being cold in a cold environment, which will affect the lips, but chap lips are peeling or very too many flower products that start to dry out the intestines. Because naturally they should be moist. The opposite, an over very wet condition, where this is really wet, can actually show like looseness in the bowels or diarrhea. That's what you see there. You see that as well. Constant chewing on the lip, biting the lip, biting inside, picking the lip, always trying to create some stimulation in the bowel. I mentioned in the last talk, people that choose to get their lip pierced or any area pierced, it's like 24-7 acupuncture. That's what that is. It's just trying to stimulate that all the time. Okay? So the color. Then, in the hand, and I'd like you to take a look at this if you don't mind. So maybe, I don't know, you can put your book down here. If you take a look between the thumb and the pointing finger, here's your thumb and the pointing finger. So these are the meridians that run through here. So this is the lung, lung area, lung, and this is the large intestine. So maybe your parents told you don't point at anyone. That's right, you're pointing your bowel at them. So, so there. If you look at the place right between the thumb and the pointing finger, that fleshy area, okay? Couple things. Push in with your thumb, don't stab yourself with your nail, but push in with your left thumb into the right area and go in pretty deep. Just push. If it's painful or it's really tender, that's showing that there's some stagnation in the ascending colon. Yeah, if you go in. And I'm not talking about like, you know, like touching. You know, give it a good push. You know, without having a flesh wound from your, your fingernail. But some of you may have had acupuncture, yes, in this room? Often they'll put a needle in that area, right? Large intestine four. Other side, pushing in, okay? That's the descending colon. So you might find one left side. That may be more tender. At the same time, massaging that, you're just sitting doing that whatever, watching TV, and it's, it's massaging it actually stimulates the intestines. As does massaging the finger itself, the pointing finger. The outside, top, usually twirling it and pulling it. But that relates to the large intestine. And even if you look at the fingers, you might see one is more swollen than the other. Ascending colon, descending colon. Okay? So you can look at the fingers and see which one looks more swollen, or maybe they're even, like that. Arthritis relates to the intestines. Arthritis is acidity 
Arthritis is acidity in the intestines that's discharging to the joints because the kidneys and the intestines are not eliminating as they should. So the acidity gathers to gather in place. Okay? In this fleshy part between the thumb and the pointing finger, what, what should be there, what, should, what it should look like is clear. There should not be any green or discoloration. There shouldn't be any freckles in that area. It should, the, the skin should look nice and clean, clear. When there's stagnation in one or the other, ascending or descending, this will start to become discolored. Okay, here or here. And as I said, it could be uncomfortable in the pushing. Okay. And next. Can someone, if someone doesn't mind, just come up to the front? I just wanna, I won't hurt you. Can we, anyone wanna volunteer a second? Come on up. She's really brave. She knows what she got herself into. Mm -hmm. Hi, what's your name? Gary, thank you. Have a seat. So, across the shoulders relate to the intestines. Yeah. The shoulders, this whole area, relates to the intestines. Many years ago, when I was studying originally at the Kushi Institute, and we had shiatsu class, or, you know, acupressure. We, had, we worked on each other. And I remember when someone worked on me, my first, like, the first day into the class, someone pushed down, the teacher did, I felt like I went through the, like, through the roof, curtain rods through here. So hard, stiff shoulders basically mean this is, this is stuck. The opposite, loose marshmallow, means that this is also very loose and weak. It should have a nice give to it and come back. So one of the things you can do if you have a partner there, or someone you can do this, there's some nice massage, very simply what you start out with, you know, in terms of like a chair massage, you start out simply doing like, kind of like this chopping like this, across, going from in to all the way out to the side. So you get a friend or somebody you can do this with, and you go across, all the way to the end, okay? Then once you do that, with leaning pressure, just go across. And you know, they can also speak up and say if it's too hard, they're ready to go through the roof, maybe you can go a little lighter, but just leaning into it. And when you're giving this, you can also feel which part of the shoulder may be more stiff. Ascending colon, descending colon. Ascending, descending. Okay? Is that okay? Some people, there's going to be pain radiating up, the back, radiating up the back of the neck from it. But this all relates to the intestines. So besides this, then you could simply knead it like that. Okay? And I'm going to show you how you can do this on yourself too, if you don't have someone to do it with you. So kneading it like that. Okay? That actually feels very nice. Right? I hope. You're getting very sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's bow talk. That'll make this funny, right? No, I'm That's a good woman. We're all gonna get a roll of Charmin on the way out. So, across. I mean, what's nice is a little leaning pressure like that. Just, just hang on. Okay. And what it does for people seriously who there's constipation, the bowels are not moving well, this helps a lot. Okay? Go across, down the side. Because everything's interconnected in the body. Because nothing's separate. So the upper part of the body relates to the lower part of the body. This is a meridian that relates to the colon. So most of us would acknowledge, yeah, getting a massage feels very nice. What it's doing is basically moving some stagnation in the body. Right? So this area relates to the colon. You said like the acupressure. Right. Thank you. That's great. So let's say you don't have someone to work with. So very simply what you can do, just simply massage your shoulder 
knead it like, like that. You might feel like an area feels tight or hard or uncomfortable. Do the other side. Actually feels good. <laughs> Okay. And very simple, I don't know if I do this in public, put your shoulder. We call that what's called do-in, D-O-I-N, which is self-massage. And the other side. Nice. I can see it now, everybody out in the street doing this. Huh? The forehead, the forehead, you see the colon as well. So this area right between the eyebrows relates to the liver. So vertical lines there basically show some stagnation in the liver. Right above that, you see the small intestine, the small intestine. And right above that, you see the large intestine, the colon. So actually, this side again, is right side is ascending, transverse, descending. Very simply, what you're looking for in the forehead, that region, is it oily? Are there pimples there? Is there something like breaking out? Is something coming out in that region? As someone's health gets better, as digestion gets better, this whole area gets clearer. And it also shows that our thinking ability is actually getting stronger. We think more clearly. You know, one of the goals with, with health is really being able to think clearly being able to think things through, does something make sense or not, to make good choices, and ultimately to listen to our own intuition to guide our life. Well, that actually comes from good digestion. So that relates to it as well, up the part of the forehead. Okay? Healthy digestion is the following, okay? Healthy digestion. Number one, we take in, right? We take in from the external world, right? We take in from the external world. Right? We break down food and ideas, right? We're breaking down food and ideas. So not just, not just eating, but we're breaking down ideas. As I said, we're, we're able to think clearly. Right? That's part of digestive health. We absorb needed nutrients. We can absorb what we take in. So we have good absorption. Okay. We can get rid of what we don't need, obviously, so we excrete what we don't need. Okay. We build strong blood cells. That's part of digestion, building strong, strong blood cells. Okay. And we can circulate that nourishment. So one of the very important things when we eat good food is we need to move it. So we need to move our bodies. We need to circulate it. Good digestion also means that we can handle temperature fluctuations. So we can handle changes in temperature. Healthy digestion also means that we feel strong on Simple food. What does that mean? That means very basic, simple food. Not elaborate, not fancy. We feel good and strong and we're satisfied. That's a very important point. Because what's happened in modern society is people have lost the ability to be satisfied and to feel strong on very simple, basic food. That's, a, that's one of the biggest problems. People have lost an appetite for that. People don't have an appetite or hunger for a bowl of oatmeal. And I mean it. We should, be, we should find even a bowl of oatmeal, just with nothing on it, actually very delicious. If you've ever had the experience of really cutting out all sweets for a while and really taking a break even from fruit, and no, you won't get sick from not having some fruit. Trust me, you won't. There's no sickness from that in a fruit. Unless you're a sailor out at sea and develop scurvy because there's no vegetables either. But there's no illness because you don't have enough fruit anyway. So I know that's gonna push some buttons with some of you who love your fruit, but I'm just saying that if you took a break from that for a little bit, no fruit, no sweets, 
grains, beans, vegetables, soups will taste totally different. Incredibly sweet. And for those of you that are parents, you know that if you start children off too young with too much sweet stuff and too much fruits, they won't appreciate vegetables. The sweetness that's in vegetable. Because that's actually the most important sweet, is how sweet vegetables can be. So at this point, I have to underline. This is very important in terms of digestion. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Strong digestion means we can neutralize extreme food. In other words, that if we take in something that's not really good for us, we can get rid of it. It may be coming out through diarrhea, or we may have frequent bowel movement, but our body knows, hey, this shouldn't be in here. When people say to me, oh, you don't want it, this makes no sense. You know, my friend so-and-so, he, she eats whatever they want and they have no problems. Yeah, they're the ones that should actually be really worrying. Because what's normal, and what you see with a child who's really clean, when they have some, something that's extreme, oh yeah, they have a reaction, both physically and their emotions. That's normal. So when people say to me, oh, I started eating vegan now, I'm eating macrobiotically, and now I'm sicker than ever. I have a piece of that, and I'm like, I I'm, I'm like, feel awful. And I never did before. Great, congratulations. That's good. Because the truth is, what happens, we get dulled to the effects of knowing really what a food is now. We don't know anymore. Oh, I have potato chips every day. I feel great. I have chocolate every single day. It's wonderful. It's like my third food group. When, I love chocolate. When you, I don't have it every day. When you start to lose that ability, that's when we don't have that sensitivity anymore. That's not a good thing. Okay. So strong digestion means we can get rid of that. Okay. And as I said before, strong digestion means very clear, rational thinking. And I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of people have lost that don't have really good, clear thinking about things, and whether something makes sense or not. Because ultimately, these decisions have to be made by ourselves. The, our, the choices that we make. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah, very important. And most importantly, healthy digestion means that will come, will come, what will come with it, is very good, strong, active intuition to guide our life. That's the most important thing with health. No one guides our life other than our own self. And our intuition should guide that. As our blood quality gets stronger, then our intuition gets clearer and sharper, like a, like magnetic. And we're very clear in our direction. Okay? That's very important. Good appetite which is really part of good digestion. What does that mean? Good appetite means we can eat a little bit, we can eat a lot. It means that. We can eat a little sometimes, and that's actually very healthy. Sometimes we eat a small amount, sometimes we eat a bigger amount. If it's always one or the other, that's not good. We should actually be able to move back and forth. Maybe it's a party or celebration, so we eat a little bit more, and then you know what, I need to rein it in a little bit. I'm gonna eat a little bit more simple now for the next whatever. Okay? Good appetite means that we can eat simple food, we can eat elaborate food. Good appetite means that we have an appetite for life itself. If we over-exercise our appetite for food and start eating too much, that diminishes our appetite for life. I'm going to talk about that when I do the lecture on uh, overeating. Okay? So physical food is a very small aspect of food and nourishment in our life. A bigger source of nourishment is our life itself. Much bigger, actually, than food. Sorry. Much bigger. You know, if I'd have to sum up what I've, what I've come to a conclusion within the last 30 years now, to, to date, about food, is we, eat much, we need much less than you think we do. And for me, at this point, three decades later after doing this work, it's right up here in my face. I don't want to look at it, but it's here right up in my face. That's what I've been looking at for the last couple of years now. How little I really need to live my life. And I've noticed that when I'm really present and really living my life and doing what I want to do, the food is not a big deal. Yeah. It's when I lose that my way and I'm not really focused on what my purpose is. Yeah. 
then I get sidetracked with the chocolate, with the ice cream, with this, with that, with more volume, whatever. And it's, it, it never, it doesn't help me. Yeah. And that's going to push buttons. Because those of us that like to eat, uh, that's a tough one. And the stronger your constitution, the stronger you are, the bigger your appetite is. So those of you who are very strong, you've got a good, strong constitution, you've got a good appetite too. So it's learning really how to manage that. It's not a bad thing. And a lot of people have this big appetite, they take appetites, um, you know, suppressing drugs for that. Because they're scared of their appetite. They're too hungry. But that's a good sign of health, having a good appetite. Yeah. Eh? So, next thing. Chewing. When we chew, what that is, is basically heaven's force and earth's force colliding. Like this. So the energy coming down, this is heaven's force. Upper jaw. Lower jaw is earth's force. They're colliding. When you chew well, you're basically activating good digestion. You're alkalizing the food. Grains digest in our mouth, not our stomach. There's a lot of criticism about grain being acidic. Well, yeah, if you want to analyze the grain and look at that, that quality, yes, you probably see some acid quality to it. But the way it's alkalized is by chewing well so it's liquid before it goes down. It's also alkalized by cooking it with sea salt, with some minerals or kombu. It's also alkalized by soaking it. It's also alkalized by often adding other vegetables to the meal with it to balance it. Okay? So there's ways that we balance it and by the use of condiments, certain condiments with the brain. Okay? So chewing is the first stage of digestion. That's what we have our teeth for. And the condition of our mouth and our teeth also shows what's going on with our digestion. That's why it's so important to keep your teeth healthy. Right? Very important. I definitely had that lesson years ago. Very important. And the truth is that people really have compromised teeth often have very serious issues with their digestion. Right? So we need to keep that, that strong. Okay? So next. What strengthens digestion? What strengthens the intestines? Let's talk about that, because that's very significant. What strengthens digestion? Okay? What strengthens it? Okay? So, in terms of making digestion strong, number one, okay? Make sure we're having enough whole grain day to day. Enough whole grain. Whole grain is not a cracker. It's not a rice cake. It's not a pretzel. It's not Kellogg's Corn Flakes. It's actually literally whole grain. In this country, we eat an enormous amount of flour products. If I would, could tell you one thing to experiment with that actually could make an enormous difference with digestion, maybe some of you are not having this, which is great, but if you want to do one experiment to help digestion, take a break from flour products for a month or two. Right? You will survive again. There's no illness not coming from flour products, not that I know of. That means no crackers, no rice cakes, no pretzels, no cookies, no muffins, no bread, no granola, no, nothing, no baked dry things. And it was overwhelming, you were in shock. Yeah. Someone asked me last year, can I go a day or two? <laughs> Try going a month. And then after a month, go a couple months. Oatmeal, oatmeal's not a flour product. Well, it's broken down, you know, there's rolled oats, of course, steel cut oats. I'm talking more baked flour and dry flour products. But amazing difference. That one thing, if you can do that. Yeah. Best oatmeal is whole oats or steel cut. Whole oats or steel cut. Okay? The grain that strengthens digestion the most and what falls into the metal element in five transformations is brown rice. Short grain, brown rice. Now, I'm not saying to eat brown rice three times a day, okay? But I'm talking about eating brown rice at one meal a day. And I'm not talking about uh, Mount Fuji of brown rice here. 
a modest portion. Like tonight we had, I think, the paella. Right? It was a small little scoop. It's not a lot. Right? So the brain doesn't have to be enormous in that. And, and some of you who may have seen in macrobiotic books, half, 50 to 60 percent in this pie chart is grain. That's by weight, not volume. So half your plate is the grain. Because grain is very heavy. And in fact, women do much better in general with less grain. But brown rice itself has a very unique ability to strengthen the intestines, especially short grain and medium grain. Long grain, which is a little bit more suitable for a hot climate, doesn't have the same strengthening ability on the intestines. And yes, it's normal in the beginning, if you're not used to eating whole grain, that you may get a little constipated in the beginning. That's normal. As the intestines start to contract again, sometimes that happens. But if you're just patient and chew well, most of the time, that'll pass quickly. Okay? So that's number one. Number two. Have with each meal well-cooked and lightly cooked vegetable side dishes. So with the grain at a meal, have well-cooked and lightly cooked vegetable side dishes. Lightly cooked vegetable side dishes are things like steamed vegetables, blanched, quick sauteed, something called pressed salad, which is like coleslaw, okay? But lightly cooked. I'm not saying not raw, but especially lightly cooked helps tremendously. Okay? And what, what lightly cooked vegetables do is they lighten up the digestive system a great deal. Some of you who have compromised digestive uh, issues, you know you can't eat raw. I mean, you feel it, it doesn't work for you. Right? So lightly cooked vegetable dishes. The other one, well cooked. So I'll describe one to you. There's a dish where basically you, you take round and root vegetables. Let's say some squash, buttercup squash or butternut squash, or what's called kabocha, parsnips, maybe cabbage, maybe some carrots, maybe onion, Combina uh, rutabaga, combination of round and root vegetables, daikon radish. You cut chunks of the vegetable. In the bottom of a pot, preferably a pot that the lid doesn't flop off of and the steam doesn't escape, you put in the bottom of the pot a piece or two of kelp, or what's called kombu, seaweed, kelp, maybe an inch piece. Put it in the bottom of a pot with a little bit of water, very small, maybe an eighth of an inch. Layer the vegetables, add a pinch or two of sea salt. Put the lid on the pot, slow cook it for about 30 minutes. At the end, you have very sweet, nourishing, round and root vegetables. If you listen closely, your intestines will start singing a happy song. They're so happy. The difference between the, the long cooked dish and the short cooked is that the long cooked are very nourishing and strengthening. Our, our body inside, our intestines and our organs relate to the plant world. I know that's far-fetched out there. What else is this guy going to tell me? They do. So there's three categories of vegetables. Rounds, root, leafy. Round vegetables, root vegetables, leafy vegetables. Those round vegetables especially nourish and support those central organs, the spleen, pancreas, and stomach. The round ones. The root vegetables, carrot, burdock, daikon, lotus root, parsnips, any of those roots, they nourish our roots. And they have a very strengthening effect in that lower part of the body. A lot of people that are not having these vegetables. You don't get that by eating salads. And again, I'm not anti-salad. Salad is very good. It lightens us up. It's cooling. It's refreshing. That's energetically what it does. But it doesn't make this strong. That's, it doesn't do that. Long cooked roots and rounds do. I, I think maybe last year, the year before, I, I, I gave, go told you this experience I had with my uh, mother-in-law. So my wife is from France, and her, her family's from Morocco. I went to, uh, I've been to France many times, but I went, went to the Louvre to visit the Louvre with my wife this time. It's a number of years back. And we ate at a restaurant there at the, uh, at the, at the uh, Louvre. It was a Lebanese restaurant. As soon as I had a bite, I was so hungry. As soon as I had the first bite, I knew I shouldn't eat it. I knew it was spoiled. I ate it anyway. Don't ask me why I ate it. I, ate it. I was just too hungry. I ate the whole thing. Couscous, whatever have you. Within like 
a half hour and saying, you know, honey, I don't feel so good. Like, I think it was what I just ate. She goes, did you eat too much? I go, no, I think it was spoiled. Are you nuts? Why'd you eat it? I ate it. Anyway, I was I was sick for like it was like two or three days. It was a nightmare. I, I don't need to get into the details, but you can use your imagination. I went over to my my wife's my, my mother-in-law's place for dinner the third night. I was still so so out of it. I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to eat. I, I'm just so sick. I don't speak really French very well, but she could see I was out of it, and she doesn't speak English. So we just smile at each other. She hugs me. She likes me. We're good. So. I'm sitting there, like, just stooped over the table. What she does, she's making tagine, vegetable tagine with couscous. She takes out of the tagine big chunks of carrot, and she pushes all the carrots over to me. That's it. Carrots. There's probably five chunks of carrots. Just like that. Eat the carrots. Right? Eat the carrots. I eat the carrots. Yeah. So bad. Then she gives me a cup of what's called vervain, it's tea, that basically, I learned later, is for digestion. My, ma my mother was macrobiotic. I leave her house, leave her apartment, and I said to my wife, you know what, your mom knows about macrobiotics. I just said she gave me all the root vegetables, of course, carrots, whatever, like, and that tea, what was that tea? Oh, because, oh that's for them, that's for digestion. Amazing. Right? There was an understanding about how food and plants do affect us. And that's the energetics of that dish. I'll describe another one that's a long cooked dish. So you take any root vegetables. Maybe you take carrot and burdock root. Do you know what burdock root is? Burdock? Burdock is growing in many people's backyards and has a little burr and it sticks on your pants. Some people know a burdock is like in some tincture or a salve. But you can actually eat burdock root. Okay? It's, a, it's a very tenacious, strong root. Okay? B-U-R-D-O-C-K. Burdock. In, in uh, Europe, in Switzerland, they call it salsify. It's very similar. So you cut diagonals and then you cut some matchsticks. Carrot, burdock, or you can do parsnip and carrot. And you saute them lightly, either in water or oil saute. You just saute it. Pinch it to a salt, you add a little water, and you steam, steam it through for maybe 10 minutes. Then you add a little ginger juice at the end. Again, your, your intestines will sing another happy song. Right? Incredibly strengthening, those root vegetables. So the combination, the balance between long cooked and short cooked are amazing. Okay? Number three, again, this is helping digestion. Keep meal times regular. Keep your meal times regular. Of course, it's easy here if someone's cooking for us. So it's, we just walk in there and have it. The challenge day to day when we're home is how to have that. Why is that so important? Because it's important not to keep our intestines guessing when food is going to come. It should be really, does it have to be to the minute? No, it doesn't. But if I look back at Really, people that have long-lived lives, what they do is there's regularity and order. My own grandmother, my mother's mother, lived to 104, okay? When I was growing up as a little kid, my sister and I used to pick on her. Why? Because this is what it would be when my grandmother came over visiting from Queens. Six in the morning. Warren, where's my breakfast? It's six o'clock. I'm like out like comatose. Grandma's yelling for breakfast. Then it's like 11.30, not 12, 11.30. My mom's name is Joy. Joy, where's lunch? It's 11.30. <laughs> then, five o'clock. Dad, da my sister's name's Daddy. Dad, where's, where's dinner? It's dinner time. Okay, like this, right? Yeah, sitting down like your dogs. Sitting down to eat, regular meals, regular times. <coughs> Was she macrobiotic? No, she ate some chicken, whatever. She ate one cookie. One cookie for dessert. Cookie was this big. Plate she ate on was this big. I mean, we used to, we used to kid all the time. She was macrobiotic. Yeah. Regular meals. Okay? Four. 
Sit down to eat without doing anything. Please, just sit and eat. You can talk, but just sit and eat. Get the TV away. I know, I see people in the room already. Oh my goodness, this is never gonna happen. No TV, no iPhone, email checking, reading store coupons, looking at bills, working in your head. My own son, who just turned nine, already caught for me. Because I'm sneaky every now and then, yeah. Read those store coupons, look at that thing. I see him reading with the magazine and store coupons. I said, Adam, what are you doing? Why, why? Because you do it. He's nine years old. Right? I said, Adam, why don't we talk? I don't want to talk. I said, how was your day today? It was okay. So I said, Adam, let's, let's have a nice quiet conversation. Papa won't read anything anymore. In order to quiet this down, this has to be quieted down too. It's very simple, but eating habits really influence digestive health. All digestive problems from colon cancer to constipation and everything in between, you have to look at eating habits. Something is off. Something is off. You have to make sure that that's really solid. Okay? Yeah. Next. Make sure that you're having some good quality fermented foods. So, we're serving miso soup here. Miso shouldn't be overly salty. So I don't want you to get the image of miso soup being incredibly salty, like you know, turning yourself into a pickle. It should actually have a nice, mild, salty flavor, but oh, not over the top salty. So you know, you might experience it here on the cruise a little strong. That's understandable, it's cooking for a lot of people. So at home, when you make it, it's about a flat teaspoon per cup of food. And miso soup at a Japanese restaurant is not the, what I'm talking about, best quality miso. I'm talking about miso that's aged two to three years. There's no chemicals that speed up the fermentation. It's a different quality miso. Companies in the US like South River Miso Company, Miso Master, very good. Mitoku brand, and good miso. And not, I'm not talking miso in a little package that you add hot water to and you stir it, whatever. Not that miso. I'm talking about miso paste. Okay? So fermented foods, pickles and fermented vegetables. What happens also, when, some, when this is compromised, intestines, sometimes we have adverse reaction to fermented foods. So what I usually recommend is to slowly incorporate it. Often what will bring us back to balance will actually bring up some discharging and make discomfort. So sometimes some people have to slowly work their say, themselves back to that. So it's not a bad thing, but sometimes it actually is making us feel worse initially. So that's why people slowly incorporate it. We have also, and I'll talk about this a little bit, something in macrobiotic cooking called umeboshi. U-M-E-B-O-S-H-I. Umeboshi, plum. Umeboshi. It's a sour, salty, actually pickled apricot. Right? It's really an apricot. Not a plum. So... What do you find that good miso? Good miso? Whole Foods has it. You can get it online, you can get it from Natural Import Company online, you can get it from healthgoods.com, you can get it from Goldmine Natural Foods, online you can order it. So umeboshi plum, even a little piece of it like that, a day, let's say with porridge or with rice, a little piece, alkalizes the digestive system, umeboshi. Yeah. Very expensive. Again, probably most of you will have to order it online. You know, there's natural foods, natural import company, naturalimportcompany.com, healthgoods.com. Okay? So fermented foods, pickle foods. Okay? Make sure that you're chewing well. Slow down and chew well. A meal should take at least 20 minutes. 20 minutes. That's how long it takes from the hypothalamus in the brain and their intestines to know you've had enough food. If we're not chewing well, then the food becomes acidic. So we need to chew. Okay? Make sure you're chewing well. Okay? 30 to 50 would be nice, but I'm not a big fan of counting chews. I think it's a little mechanical, but some other teachers I know recommend it. I'd rather people really try to relax and settle down and just actually chew their food. 
And actually, good food tastes better the more you chew it. Poor quality food doesn't taste better. Right? Sugar cookies don't taste great when you chew them a hundred times. Right? You know, a Twinkie doesn't taste better the more you chew it. Right? Good quality food tastes better the more you chew it. Right? Walk outside every day. Take a good walk. Initially, when people's intestines are compromised and you start walking or do activity, you feel worse because you're creating movement and circulation. That's what happens. But once you get over that, then yes, you start to feel, you'll start to feel better. Okay? Do some kind of good abdominal activity on a regular basis. So it's very funny, the basic things we do in day-to-day -day life at home, cleaning, mopping, in the season, raking leaves, any kind of activity that puts a little pressure on the abdomen helps for digestion. You can do specific things, yes, like yoga, tai chi, you can do you know, pilates, all those things of course help. But abdominal activities, things that strengthen the abdominal area. Okay? Finish eating at least three hours before bedtime. And that doesn't mean finish dinner at 10 and go to bed at 1. Okay. So I'm going to give you the excuse here on the, cute, or the, the cruise. Don't worry, I'm not spying on you. 10 o'clock at night when you have your coconut bliss. You know? I will tell you this, if you haven't had coconut bliss at 10 o'clock, why don't you at least take it and sit down and eat it? You don't need to eat it standing up. You'll enjoy it more. It's not what's going to happen. People are going to be scarfing it down, getting another one. Standing up is not for eating. Standing up is for activity. This position of sitting, when I sit, this is a transition between lying down and standing up. So this is the best position for taking in food and actually for reading. When I stand up, my intestines are not relaxed. This is relaxed now. I have a much better sense of how much I need to eat sitting. When I'm standing, I don't. This position is best also taking in the written word. When I'm lying down, this is terrible for eating. It slows down digestion. And then also putting feet up after you eat a meal and watching the TV. So if you're going to watch TV after eating, at least keep one foot on the ground to keep your digestion activated. Mm -hmm. Best thing to do after eating is actually do the dishes by hand. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> because actually the, 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 the zen of dishwashing, ready for this one? Yeah, I do too, I love it. My wife and I battle with it. I go away from, I go away on trips, the dishwasher, I come home, it's loaded, packed to the hill, just clean, they've been in there for the last four days. I come, have to unload the dishwasher. Then I'm home, and every single dish is like washed like that. Yeah? The Zen of dishwashing is, you're focusing on your hara. This is the hara. So when you're washing the dishes, you focus your energy here. This gets stronger. It's actually not in your arms. It's in here. So it actually helps digestion when you focus on I told you that. Is. You can mop the floors. Alright, I'll do that. Going for a walk. Going for a walk? Yeah, I mentioned that. Okay? So finish eating three hours before bedtime. And that's very important. Very important. I mean, let's take a poll. Can you be honest? So it's not just me. How many of you are snacking at night? Let, let's. Yeah. Does that include fruit? I'm not even going to answer that one. I promise you, I promise you, life-changing results to get out of that. And the way you get out of it is you make sure that during the day you really are satisfied with your food. Make sure during the day you're really more satisfied with your food and your meals. And you're less likely to need something at night. Take maybe a warm shower at night to, to relax yourself and settle down so that you don't need to eat something to unwind. Have maybe a cup of some non-caffeinated you know, tea or some kind of warm or hot beverage 
to relax you to settle down. If you build up enough days where you're not eating late at night and you get that momentum with you, you're off to the races and you'll stop that habit. You will sleep better. You'll probably lose a pound or two. You'll feel better in the morning. Your energy will be much better. Eating late at night wreaks havoc on your intestines, your liver, your kidneys. It's one of the worst habits. Yeah. Focus on trying to eat balanced during the day. Ideally, we should be done at 7 o'clock. You know? And you know, I know for some people who are working late, it's a problem. And I get that. And I tell clients of mine who have certain health issues, you know, long term, you've got to switch to somehow get out of that. You know, I've seen people eating at 10 o'clock at night constantly. And there are certain health problems that won't get better no matter what you're eating. And that even if it's good food, it's because it's late at night. Certain reproductive issues, especially for men and women, prostate issues, uterine issues, cervical issues, fibroids, eating late at night, never get better. No, won't get better. Because that excess at night basically gets stored in the liver. And the liver meridian runs right through the reproductive organ. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Then next. Okay? So, what harms the digestion? Let's talk about that a little bit. What harms the di harms digestion? Number one, overeating in general. Too much food. Too much food. Taking in simply too much. Basically, when we overread, it creates an overly acidic condition. Healing the liver, healing the gallbladder, healing most organs requires eating less food. Because what happens, when we take in less, then our body can start working on healing those organs. They start to adjust and rebalance themselves. When we're taking in excess day in and day out, our body is simply working on dealing with the excess. Okay. That's the problem. That's why I've seen when people change their health more quickly, they're able to eat a little bit more modestly. Right? We can do that. So, slowing down, chewing the food well, breathing before you start the meal. How you start a meal really influences how the meal goes. So if you can start out slowly and chew really well, that helps. Okay? So overeating. I mentioned already, not sitting down to eat without doing other things, right? So not sitting down, okay? Irregular meals and meal times. So some of these are the opposite, okay? Not including grain and veg at every meal. Every meal we have should have a grain and a vegetable dish. Okay? Excessive amounts of flour products. So I, I offered that little challenge to you, getting off of flour products. Of course, excessive amounts of animal food and dairy food affecting digestion. Or actually, the worst. Okay? Lack of good quality fermentation. Chemicalized and overly refined foods. Ice cold beverages and foods, ice cold foods, are terrible for digestion. Eating and drinking. So when you eat, you should not be drinking liquids. All the, all the food that we're eating in a plant-based diet has plenty of liquid in it. So the drinking really should be at the end of the meal, not during the meal. When people are eating, when people are eating animal food, dairy food, lots of flour products, dry things, salty things, then people are eating and drinking, but that spoils digestion. It really should be at the end of the meal. It can be right away, yeah. Okay. Medications and recreational drugs. And this is a big one I'm going to say right now, because yeah, of course you can't reverse this, but when we've had abdominal surgeries, any of the following, we have to be much more careful with problems that are going to go to the upper part of the body, because as this is weakened, then problems come here. And specifically, more well, lung problems and also breast problems, because there's a relationship between up and down. They're not separate. As a human being, we discharge down, not up. So when there's been appendectomies, hysterectomies, C-sections, 
abortions, tubal ligation, vasectomy, extensive use of IUDs, you're weakening what's called the hara, the lower part of the body. So when, that's, when those have happened in the past, you have to be very careful and work much harder at getting this strong now. Because when those surgeries happen, you're cutting through the meridians, and now they're weak. What happens often is people will, will uh, worsen that by then choosing foods that also weaken the lower part of the body more. So you have to be very careful, but that's very common. A couple, more than a couple years, a few years back, New York, uh, the Time Magazine wrote it, came out with an article on the cover page. I remember I was in Austin, Texas when it came out. Why breast cancer is spreading around the world? Why breast cancer is spreading? So, remember, I bought the, I, had, I get a subscription, but I want to read it. I'm so excited to read this and see what they say. I read the article. There was no mention of why it was increasing. It was basically statistics and facts and figures. So I wrote a letter to the editor. I didn't use any like yin and yang lingo in the thing. I explained what I've observed with those connections of upper and lower and the foods that go where in the body. And I got a nice kind of form letter back. Oh, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. You know, you don't know if we can publish this. Anyway, but I did write it. But anytime this is weakened, then this is affected. Upper and lower connected, as well as front and back. That's why when also the, this gets tight back here, especially towards the lower part of the body near the sacrum, then this expands because this is a front-back relationship. That's why some people may have noticed when they have too much salt, kidneys contract, belly gets swollen. Right? Like that. Front and back, up, up and down. Okay? And then last but not least, a sedentary lifestyle. So not active. Okay? Digestive system problems, okay, basically fall into two, two areas, okay, two categories. I describe it, one is, we say, a, a yang cause, what time is this over? Now? Now. Uh, Alright, I'll keep you a few more minutes, I'm sorry. Now you're okay? All right. One has come from contraction. The other is overexpansion. Contraction, the intestines get stagnant and st stuck and sluggish. The other is they become loose and expanded and weak. So what causes the first one is more the young one. Animal foods, Baked foods, some baked, baked flour products especially, overly salty foods, and a lack of good quality grain and vegetable, whole grain and vegetable, a lack of that. A lack of lightly cooked vegetables. Okay? And of course, poor eating habits. That's always in the background. And that includes mixing food on the plate. So that means, let's say you have on your plate, you have some grain, you have some vegetable bean, and instead of taking a bite, of, you know, chew it while swallow it, you throw it all together, mishmash, and you eat it all on one fork on chopstick, or you take it all and throw it in your soup. And then you eat it standing up. People that have weak intestines manage to find a way to perpetuate weak intestines by doing just that. So you want to eat in an orderly way. It doesn't mean you have to finish one pile, you take a bite of grain, you chew it or swallow it, take a bite of vegetable, chew it or swallow it, go back to the grain, you work your way around the plate in an orderly fashion. Almost like how children don't like things touching, that's good, that's healthy. When you eat in an orderly way, your intestines become orderly and your mind becomes orderly. The problem is there's a lot of chaotic eating. Acid reflux, GERD, many of these things. You have to create good order and structure, not eating late at night, and staying away from things that are creating this over acidity. The other type, the, the yin version of, constant, of yin digestive problem, is from a lack of whole grain, a lack of well-cooked vegetable dishes. I described the two to you. 
lack of pickles and fermentation, and often too much sugar, fruits, juices, sweets, and in some cases too much raw, and in some cases too many blended smoothie things, which the intestines now loose and expanded, those perpetuate it. So again, I'm not saying raw is bad. I eat raw. I have it more in the summer months than I do the winter months. But certain digestive conditions, colitis, Crohn's, IBS, etc., raw doesn't work. Just does not help. Does not help. Okay. So the solution for that one, the yin one, whole grain, especially miso soup. Occasionally grain vegetable miso soup, where grain is actually cooked into miso soup. So it's a kind of like a grain vegetable porridge like that. Steamed greens on a regular basis, daily basis. Okay. And of course, orderly balanced eating. One of the most powerful remedies to strengthen the intestines, especially when there's overly acidic condition. So this remedy I recommend for all colitis, Crohn's, or bobal, a silver acidity. It's called ume shokuzu. Ume shokuzu. So again, it's U-M-E, which is for umeboshi plum, ume. Sho, which is soy sauce or tamari. I'm not talking Sanjay or Kikomen. I'm talking about maybe Eden or the Toku brand. Not Sanjay or Kikomen, which is alcohol and sodium benzoate. Good quality soy sauce or tamari. For those of you that are gluten free, there's wheat free tamari. You can get that from Eden Foods. There's wheat free tamari. So ume, sho is the soy sauce or tamari. And then something called kuzu or kudzu. Kuzu is a root starch. Kudzu, kuzu root. What's in kuzu is actually what heals the intestines a great deal. And that's called glutamine. Glutamine is one of the most important ingredients to heal the gut. Glutamine is in seaweed. Glutamine is in miso. Glutamine is in kuzu. A number of years back, Anderson Cooper on CNN did actually a piece on kuzu root because they were using it to stabilize blood sugar in diabetics. Kudzu. So you probably have to order it online. I don't think you're going to find it most schools. In Boston, where I live, we do have it at some of the Whole Foods. But you probably have to order it, you know, again, natural import company or health goods. I didn't see it at the store here this year, Kuzu, K-U-Z-U. The way you make it, very simply, take one cup of water, take a teaspoon of Kuzu, one teaspoon of Kuzu root, like a heaping teaspoon, simply dilute the kuzu in the cool water. This water is cold, not hot. Dilute the kuzu in this, put that in the saucepan, add about a quarter to a half of an umeboshi plum. You just chop it up, okay? Just bring it to a boil. Stir it constantly, bring that to a boil. When this bubbles, it'll thicken a little bit. Then you add a few drops of your tamari soy sauce. Anyone with any kind of irritation in the bowel, ulcers or anything I've mentioned, within five minutes will be hooked on this and will want to have it for a while. Guaranteed. You can email me and tell me that it didn't work if that's you really, if you did it and really never noticed that. I've been using this for 30 years. I hope Kuzu is always available to us. If there's bleeding, if there's rectal bleeding, what works in this is something called lotus root lotus root. So you take some fresh lotus root, which you have to probably get in an Asian market. It's going to be hard to find it organic. You grate a little lotus root, like a tablespoon or two. And what you do is you squeeze some of the juice from the lotus root into that, like you would ginger juice. And you squeeze it into the drink, like towards the end. And you drink it with lotus juice. That's for bleeding. It's very good for ulcers or bleeding of the of the mouth. Oh, yeah. Lotus juice. Lotus root juice. Ume shokuza. Ume shokuza. Okay. While I'm not a very big supplement person, and I'm not opposed to him that he's using them, 
I found that actually certain supplements that actually have a good amount of glutamine, glutamine in it actually have been very helpful to heal some of these very serious digestive issues. So that I've been recommending in the last couple of years in Brazil. But very powerful. I try to get that more from food because those help a lot. Okay. Also, with acid reflux and issues with this acidity, very often what's involved is the pancreas. So what happens is the center, the center of the body here, this is actually deep organ, the pancreas, very often is too tight and pressured inside, literally too contracted, right below the sternum. It's too pressured. That gets affected by too many dry, hard things as well. And then this whole digestion is not smooth. So this has to be relaxed as well. Dry what? By what? Dry, hard things. Crackers, chips, pretzels, popcorn, rice cakes, toast, granola, salty things. All those things make that tightness deep inside. And that's what also affects the reflux. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And sometimes when this is that tight, the pressure, a hot water bottle over this area nightly helps. Soaking the feet, a nice warm foot soak helps. But relaxing the central region, and those round sweet vegetables help as well. Okay? Again, my observation now over the years is that really many of these digestive problems, from constipation to more extreme growth, really can be reversed. Some are very, I've seen some very extreme ones this last year but I've seen very good success. Simple things like, I say simple, constipation. Either the intestines are too expanded and loose or too tight and contracted. What complicates it, yes, if we've had certain surgeries, that may make it a little bit more difficult and compromised in terms of the gut. But those, those are the you know, basic principles that, that help. Yeah? Yeah, the question is about, do I have any opinion about AIDS for, for that, to help with digestion and constipation? So, you know, for me, I, I, I do things a little bit more subtle. If someone has constipation, again, is it yin or yang constipation? So you have to determine, are the intestines too loose and swollen or tight and contracted? When it's too tight and contracted, things like, yeah, a little bit of poached apple, cooked pear, cooked fruit with kuzu, with kuzu. A very thin kuzu would help making it more sweet. Something called black soybean tea. You take a cup black turtle beans, but black soybeans, a half a cup of them. Add two cups of water to them, bring it to boil, simmer 25 minutes, and drink it. That actually helps too. Another remedy with a seaweed called agar. You take a tablespoon of agar. You put that in a little bit of apple juice and water. You bring it to a boil, and you drink it before it, it, it uh, hardens. That's helpful. So, I mean, there's certain remedies that I use for it that that work. That's not the first thing I use. Yeah, I mean, he asked me about prunes or dry fruit. I first would go to cooked pear, or cooked apple. If it's yang constipation, again, you have to determine that. And again, diagnosis-wise, when the bottom lip is more swollen, generally it's more yin constipation. If it's more tight and contracted, there's no bottom lip. That's more yang constipation. So you have to determine well, which, which, where is it coming from? That's the important thing. Yeah. Are there potatoes and about? Like, potatoes? Potatoes are one of the worst things for the intestines. I'm sorry. No. Tubers, which are sweet potato and yam, they're okay, but too many of them can actually weaken the intestines. Too many tubers. Potatoes in general, regular white potatoes, no, that's not great for the intestines. And the worst, the worst is French fries for the intestines. What about wine? Wine for the intestines? Yeah, for bacteria I can give you 200 health issues that wine makes worse. So wine is not like the end all fix all. It's highly, highly acidic. So I'm not saying never, it depends on our health but I can give you a laundry list of problems, you know? That makes, it's, that make inflammation worse. Yeah. 
If the soup is made where it's cooked together with it, then it melds together like Hungarian goulash. It's cooked together. When you take things cooked separately and throw it together, that's not good. How many yams is too many? 17 and a half yams. <laughs> you know what? It depends. I know when I've eaten too many yams, I feel it. So it really depends on the, on the person. It, it's hard to say how many. It really depends. You should feel it. Oh, this doesn't feel so, so good. They're heavy. Tubers actually go to the lower part of the body. So they go down. So they're actually good to put on weight. Tubers actually put weight on the hips. So if you have nothing down there and you want something there, eat some tubers. They go right here and they go here. So if, you're, if there's nothing there, then, you know, I could probably lose it. <laughs> but anyway, that's what they do. Warren, how about other whole grains? Uh, Brown, quinoa, uh, barley? Great, if, you're not, if you don't have an issue with gluten. Yeah. All I'm pointing out is that the grain that strengthens the most is brown rice. Mm -hmm. Quinoa, barley, millet, all those things, they're fine. The distinction is about the flour products that are buying. That, that's the problem. Yeah. My website is here, macrobioticsnewengland.com. It's over here, macrobioticsnewengland.com. Hopefully this is the year that my cookbook comes out. I have someone helping me finally, so. Yeah, Kuzu is my, my website. 1-800-GO-KUZU. No, no, gotta use the plug. Probiotic? Number one, probiotic first should come from food. Probiotic is miso soup. Probiotic is good enzymes that you get in food. But with that being said, I actually like probiotics. I, you know, with, even with my own life of travel, I, uh, I, I 